Yamaha has been making musical instruments for over 100 years and making sound reinforcement equipment since the 1970s. Today, Yamaha sound reinforcement products from analog and digital mixers to amplifiers, loudspeakers, signal processors, mixing engines and more are used in venues throughout the world from cafes to concert halls. Musical instruments and sound reinforcement are two sides of the same coin. Music production on the one hand, music reproduction on the other. So it's no surprise that Yamaha musical equipment works so well together. But just because the equipment is designed well, it doesn't necessarily follow that everyone automatically knows how to connect it up and operate it. Sound and sound reinforcement are complex subjects that encompass science, art and practical experience. The purpose of this program is to explore sound reinforcement from many angles, the individual pieces of equipment and how they work, how to connect it all up, how to use it, and finally, how real people in real life situations tackle some real life issues. This program assumes nothing and requires no knowledge about sound reinforcement. We simply assume you have a reason to want to learn about the subject, be it from a performing or engineering or installation or educational point of view. And since the subject is so wide and constantly evolving, you'll find many links to websites that can keep you up to date with the solutions and technologies as they develop. Principles, however, remain constant, and we hope that this voyage of discovery will provide you with a good basic understanding from both theoretical and practical standpoints of sound reinforcement systems, whether you're looking to buy, operate, use, or simply looking to find out what's going on. So let the journey begin. Go to a concert in a stadium, listen to a local duo in a local bar, pay attention to your minister, your lecturer, a candidate at a political rally, and a large slice of what you're hearing has been captured by one of these, a microphone. A microphone picks up the sound of a guitar amp or drums or acoustic piano and turns it into an electrical signal that can be amplified, mixed in with everything else, and then sent out through the loudspeakers for the world at large to hear. Mics may not vary too much in the looks department. Basically, they're all 4 to 10 inch metal cylinders that you sing into or point towards an instrument or amp, but there are hundreds of different mics to choose from. Plus, there are several fundamentally different types of mic made for different applications. And since a mic can set you back anywhere from 50 cents to $5,000, you'll do yourself a large favor by understanding where and when your money is best spent. Mics may all look fairly similar, but in fact there are several different ways of converting sounds into electrical signals, and this results in there being several fundamentally different types of microphone, each suited to a particular application or even different type of sound. The type of mic you see most often on stage is a dynamic mic. Dynamic mics work on the principle of a diaphragm attached to a moving coil in a magnetic field, and one of the world's most popular dynamic mics is this Shure SM58. Dynamic mics are rugged and models are available for anything from vocals to a guitar amp to a snare drum and generally they're not terribly expensive. Right, so why use anything else you might ask? Well dynamic mics are not overly sensitive. In other words your sound source needs to be pretty close in order to be picked up. This is great for most applications on stage but for some of the more delicate instruments or when the mic can't be placed closely to the sound source a condenser mic is required. Condenser mics work a little differently. They still have a diaphragm, but they're much thinner and lighter, and in place of a moving voice coil, air pressure influences a capacitor, or condenser. Generally, condenser mics are more sensitive than dynamic mics. OK, so why aren't we all using condenser mics then? Well, along with this sensitivity come certain handling concerns. You may need to treat a condenser mic more carefully than a dynamic, due to the additional electronics required to make condenser mics operate, even though newer models designed specifically for live sound applications are now in fact suitably rugged. That said, condenser mics don't particularly like moisture, and since they are more sensitive, they are subject to handling noise. 
Also, you might not want a mic that picks up everything on stage. Sure, you want the singer to be heard when they're singing, but when they're not, you don't really want the mic to pick up everything else on stage that's being played at the same time. Also, some form of external power is needed for these electronics. You can connect an external power supply, or use a mixer that provides phantom power. All Yamaha mixers provide this feature. So how about these guys, radio or wireless mics? The most obviously missing part of a wireless mic is the wire or cable. A conventional mic converts sound into an electrical signal that travels down the cable to your mixer. A wireless mic also converts that electrical signal into a radio signal that is transmitted to one of these, the receiver, which then turns the radio signal back into an audio signal that can be fed into your mixer as normal. A mic without a cable to get caught up in? Brilliant! Right, so why isn't everyone using one of these? Well, although wireless systems have improved beyond belief since the early days, when receivers not only used to pick up the signal from your transmitter, but also transmissions from the local police force or taxi cab service, they still do need careful setting up, especially if several people need to use them on the same stage, and where each person needs to transmit on their own radio frequency. Compared to conventional mics, they're also a lot more expensive. Wireless mics come in all shapes and sizes, though from handheld mics like this, to tiny mics that pin onto your shirt, to mics that attach to a head-worn device for virtual invisibility. Relying solely on wireless mics is probably not a good idea unless you have the money and personnel to make sure everything is correctly set up and handled and maintained. At the very least, have some regular hardwired mics as backups. You might think that all there is to using a mic is having it switched on and singing into the right end. Yeah, to a point. But some mics pick up signals strongly from one direction and only a little from another. And exactly how or where a mic is configured to pick up sound from is called its polar pattern. This is especially important for stage use because you'll achieve the best stage sound if every mic you use is only picking up the signal you want it to pick up and not a whole bunch of extraneous noise. The converse is also true. You want your mics to pick up all of the sound or sounds you need mic'd and not just say half of the brass section or one of the backing vocalists. A mic offering a so named cardioid or heart shape pattern picks up sound mainly from the front and the sides and almost nothing from the back. This type of polar pattern is usually the most desirable for live sound as it will reject sound coming from beside or behind the mic. An omnidirectional pattern picks up sound from all around. Omni mics are typically not employed for live sound except in the case of theatrical clip-on or head-worn mics. There are other polar patterns as well, but for live sound reinforcement, cardioid and its close cousins the supercardioid and hypercardioid are really the only choices you need to consider. If you have the budget to spend thousands of dollars on mics, that's great. Realistically, you're going to have to make a compromise, though, and make concessions. And actually, that's fine for all but the most sophisticated of live performance applications. Mics like the Shure SM57 and 58 have not become industry standards by accident. You can use them on vocals, you can use them to mic up an amp, to mic a snare drum, and they'll behave just fine and probably will only let you down if you drop them in a glass of beer or run it over. Yes, actually, most mics don't like water, and while you can hammer nails with an SM58, some form of casing is always a good idea when it comes to transporting or storing mics. OK, so now you've chosen the right mic, how do you actually use it? This is not quite as silly a question as it might sound, because mic placement and mic technique are both crucially important factors for successful live sound reinforcement. An obvious rule of thumb says that the closer you place your mic to a sound source, the louder the signal will be. But listen to the changes here when we move this mic around in front of a guitar amp. With the mic pointing at the speaker, the sound is true, but it can be a bit hard if it's pointing directly at the cone of the speaker. Moving it to the side, or turning the mic sideways so that it's what we call off-axis, will often soften the sound.
you can use a regular mic stand with a boom, or you could thread the cable through an amp's handle and drape the mic down the side of the cabinet. This is a perfectly legitimate technique. Here, above all, don't be afraid to experiment. A guitar amp's mic is not going to wander about during the gig very much, but when it comes to vocals, movement is somewhat unavoidable. So let's look at this thing called mic technique. A mic may not be an instrument as such, but there's definitely a technique to using one. Take the amateur talent contest, where you can often come across a great singer whose vocal gets louder and softer as they wander about in front of the mic, sometimes hitting the element in the mic dead centre, other times singing outside of it altogether. Watching a seasoned professional singer, and yes, they too will move the mic around, but here you'll notice they're actually manipulating the sound, tone and intensity of their voice by how loud they're singing and how close they are to the mic when they're doing so. Close in, they'll sing relatively softly, get quite a deep, rich tone, thanks to something called the proximity effect. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. As they increase their own volume, they'll proportionately pull back the mic or move their head away. So that although their voice seems to be getting louder, actually what you're hearing is simply a greater intensity level. You're suddenly not deafened by the vocal, in other words. This, and more, is called good mic technique. When you're testing or setting up your own mic on stage, you need to set your levels so that when you sing or talk softly, the tone and levels will be good. And when you sing at your loudest, the signal will not overload and your mix will distort. The biggest enemy of life on stage is feedback. This painful whistling noise, caused when a microphone hears a nearby loudspeaker, is typically blamed on the microphone. Please view the special section on the subject of feedback and how to avoid it. The mixer is the brain of your sound reinforcement system. A wide variety of sound sources are sent into a mixer. Vocal mics, instruments, mic amplifiers, CD player. And the mixer will then process and balance all of them into one unified sound or mix for your audience to listen to. It's a complicated procedure, and you certainly don't become a skilled front of house engineer overnight. Having said that, Understanding a mixer is not actually as forbidding as at first glance it might seem. Why? Because although it seems as if you have to learn an entire panel's worth of knobs and faders, a mixer is mostly made up from what are called channel strips, all of which have identical controls. So, learn the controls on one channel strip and you've learned them all. There's more to a mixer than channel strips, of course, but that's a great start to this particular voyage of discovery. A mixer has more things connected to it than any other device in the sound system. Signals coming in are referred to as inputs. Signals coming out, outputs. This is a standalone mixer, which you connect to an amplifier and loudspeakers. Some mixers also include amplification, and these are called powered mixers. These are covered later in this scene. On standalone mixers, the inputs are normally situated here, at the rear, though sometimes you'll come across a mixer with inputs right at the back of the main panel. This is where you plug in the cables from your instruments and microphones, and each of these connects to an individual channel on your mixer, so that you can make individual adjustments to that sound. You'll notice that each channel has two input connectors. One, a multi-pin balance connection called an XLR, which is mainly for microphones, and the other, a quarter-inch jack connector marked Line which essentially you use for most everything else. Mixers are used to process sound, and sometimes this involves the use of special audio effects. Although some mixers may come with an effects processor built in, you may also want to use a dedicated effects processor. And these are also plugged in at the back. There are two methods of connecting effects units to a mixer. The first is into an individual channel via a two-way connection called an insert point. This you would use for a device that's designed to be used just on one sound or one channel at a time, like a compressor or limiter. The second is into a circuit called an auxiliary bus, 
which then lets any channel make use of the effect. You'd use this method for something like a digital reverb unit. An auxiliary bus? It's simply a special piece of wiring in a mixer that can be tapped into by other channels or controls, rather like, well, stops on a bus route. So we have a number of sound sources and effects processors coming into the mixer. How does the sound leave? All mixers will have at least one set of outputs that carry the unified or mixed signals out to your main amplification system. Usually, they'll have a second set of outputs that can send a different balance or mix to an amplification system designed for the musicians or performers on stage to hear, so that they can monitor or listen to themselves and each other. This is called a monitor system, and that mix will come out of its own set of outputs at the back. Completing our front panel overview, the other knobs and faders, aside from those that run along the channel strip, relate to the effects and monitoring and the group functions. This area of the mixer is referred to as the master section, as it has all of the output controls. We've identified something called a channel strip, but what does it actually do? A channel strip is simply a row or strip of controls that all relate to a single input channel. A quick glance at a channel strip will tell you an awful lot about a mixer. What sort of EQ or tone control it offers, how much flexibility there is in terms of monitoring and patching in effects. At the top is one of the most crucial areas of the mixer, the input. This is important both in terms of the quality of the actual components and the care that you take in terms of setting the input level. This is the point at which your sound source enters the mixer, and the strength of this signal is governed by the gain control, sometimes referred to as a trim pot. This regulates the strength of input signal. On some mixers you may also find a pad switch for instant attenuation. Sometimes you might even find a pad switch and a trim pot. Learning to set these controls properly is really important. If a sound gets off on the wrong foot, so to speak, it's almost impossible to correct the problem later on. Whoever coined the phrase, fix it in the mix, certainly didn't mix live sound. First you need to make sure that the sound source is coming into the mixer at a level that'll give you as much clean, i.e. undistorted, signal as possible. Ideally, you want to end up with all your sound sources at the same strength of signal. You'll need to make adjustments at this stage because different devices output sound at different levels. Microphones, for instance, output low-level signals and so need greater initial amplification here. Electronic keyboards, effects units or CD players produce more initial signal, so they don't require as much amplification. The reason setting input gain is so important is that if you don't get enough signal into the mixer, the signal won't be strong enough and attempts to increase the output volume will add noise and hiss. Bad news, to be sure. But worse, if you have too much signal coming in, your sound is going to be distorted. If a sound is distorted at the input stage, you'll never be able to undistort it. It's like trying to carry an overflowing bucket of water. It'll never work. You need to take some water out, then you can carry it. These initial decisions are crucial to what is referred to as your gain structure. Basically, keeping your mixer and mix as free from either distortion or extraneous noise as possible. Good gain structure is essential if you want your mix to sound clean and punchy. By far you have to have proper gain structure. Without proper gain structure you're 10 steps behind. OK, to set the input gain properly, position your channel fader at 0 dB or unity gain and then ask the performer to send the strongest or loudest signal he or she is likely to play or sing. Make your adjustment so that the meter or peak LED for that channel just nudges into the red. If your input signal barely registers, then you need to increase the gain. If the signal is too hot or loud, like this, you need to turn it down. Following good gain structure practices at each stage that sound passes through your mixer is half the battle when it comes to getting a good mix. Armed with this array of knobs, you may be tempted to now start fiddling around, adjusting tone controls, adding effects and so on. But in fact, the sound system actually consists of more than just electronic gear. Professional audio engineers know that a good sound starts at the source. In fact, most of these folks live by the rule, he who uses EQ and effects the least, uses them best. 
So, if the singer sounds like he's got bronchitis or the snare drum sounds feeble, the first thing you need to do is to make sure that the microphone is positioned as it should be in order to capture the sound properly. Then you might want to try swapping the mic, or suggest, tactfully, that the drummer may want to tune his snare or even replace one of the heads. The point is, the better the original sound, the better your final mix will turn out because you're not having to compensate for weaknesses that you have little control over. You're simply making the performances louder. Sometimes tonal adjustment is necessary, and that's where these next controls come into play. EQ is short for equalisation, and all mixers offer some form of control, be it a simple high, mid or low, boost or cut like the tone controls on a basic home stereo, or a sophisticated system where particular frequencies in a sound can be isolated and adjusted. We'll look at the whole subject of EQ in greater detail in another scene. For now though, here are three handy tips to keep in mind about EQ. 1. Use it sparingly. Too much EQ will almost invariably make a sound unnatural. 2. Cutting or reducing the level of certain frequencies can be just as powerful as boosting frequencies when it comes to improving a sound or curing a problem. 3. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. If a sound doesn't need any tonal adjustment, don't make any. And to help solve some specific problems, here is a simple switch that automatically filters out low rumble type noise. It's called a high pass filter. This switch comes in handy if you want to reduce wind noise from microphones when working outside. It could also protect your loudspeakers from damage if someone accidentally dropped a microphone. Mixers are riddled with abbreviated names for odd sounding features. And here's another one, AUX. The prime duty of a mixer is to combine multiple sound sources into one unified signal going out into the main speakers. That's not all they do though. Most mixers provide AUXs, or auxiliary signal buses that tackle additional requirements such as being able to add effects to a particular sound and being able to deliver a mix for monitors on stage. Both such capabilities are handled by auxiliary buses and controls, normally referred to by their abbreviated name of AUX. When you see an AUX rotary control on a channel strip, it's really just another level control, adjusting the amount of signal from that channel to that particular AUX bus. AUX buses come in two varieties, namely pre-fader or post-fader. Sometimes they can be switched, as indeed they can here. If the AUX bus is pre-fader, this means that your sound is being sent to the AUX buses before it comes under the control of its main channel fade. Pre meaning previous or before. What does that mean though? Well, it means that adjusting the main channel fader will not disturb the amount of signal going to the AUX bus. And that's important because you don't want, say, a monitor mix to change just because a particular sound has been increased or decreased in the main mix. Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? So why on earth would we need a post-fader setting then? Think about effects. Say you set up a nice effect on a voice, some slapback echo or reverb. Now, if you want to adjust the overall level of that vocal, you'll also want to adjust what gets sent to the effects device. So if this aux is post-fader, post meaning after the fader, then the two will always go hand in hand, just as you wanted. Moving down, pan is another abbreviated term, short for panorama. Just as it sounds, the pan control can send a particular input to the far left, far right, or dead center. While we're on the subject of panning, it's best not to pan signals full left or full right. In a live sound setting, very few people in the audience will be hearing both left and right speakers equally. And if you completely pan something all the way to the right, people on the left-hand side of the audience probably won't be able to hear it at all. While most switches and controls actively process or affect sounds, others are there just to help you keep track of things. And this can be very important when you have the pressure of a live show to deal with. This switch, for instance, gives you a helpful visual indication of which channels are on and are being sent into the main stereo outputs. This small switch, marked PFL, which stands for Pre-Fader Listen, allows you to instantly hear the sound of that particular channel in your headphones, no matter whether the channel fader is up or down. And this can be a great help to check and confirm signals without disturbing your main mix. PFL is also extremely helpful when setting your initial input levels, because you can do this A, without the sound coming out of the mains, and B, because you can make use of the main level meters for additional visual help. Finally, 
is the fader or slider that increases or decreases the channel output. Some mixers may use a knob for this, but the function is the same. We've covered a lot of ground here, so let's recap. At the top of the channel strip are the input controls where you set the level of signal coming into the particular channel. This is followed by EQ controls that govern tone, then come the AUX send levels sending varying amounts of your channel to the monitor mix or to a connected effects processor, and finally come the pan control, channel on switch and main channel fader. Encouragingly then, you can see that we've covered more than three quarters of the controls in this mixer. Enough theory for the moment, let's take one or two individual instruments and see what happens in practice. The first thing I like to start with is the bass. The bass player here has a nice amp that has a balanced line out feature. It makes it really easy to get a good bass sound in the mixer. I just need to take a long XLR cable from the amp and plug it into one of our mixer channels. Then I ask the bass player to play about as loud as he thinks he's going to play. I turn on the pre-fader listen and then adjust the trim pot so that you get a good hot signal that just peaks in the red, but doesn't really distort. This bass player uses a lot of finger technique as well as slap and pop styles, so I've inserted a compressor in the channel just to smooth the dynamics out a little bit. The bass sound already has enough bass on it, so I don't really need to do any boosting there, but I like to add a bit of mid-range growl to the bass. Depending on how much slapping or popping he's doing or playing with his fingers, sometimes I'll add just a little extra high end just to help cut through the mix. Once I have a sound that I'm happy with, I turn off my PFL and I bring up the channel fader and see how it sounds in the main speakers. Because the bass player already has an amp on stage, there's no real reason to add any bass into the monitor mix. There's already plenty of volume from his amp for the rest of the band to hear. As for the snare drum, we're going to position the mic down towards the head of the snare. Our drummer's already tightened up the head, and we've got a good initial sound. Once we've gotten the mic positioned, it's pretty much the same process like I did with the bass player. I get the drummer to play just about as loud as he's going to play on the snare drum, and I bring up the trim control, adjusting the volume till I get a good signal, but not too hot. I like a nice punchy sound to my snare, so one thing I'm going to do is add a little EQ. There's not a lot of bass already on the snare, so I don't have to do anything there, but I'm going to add a little high end to give a good snap, and a little mid-range like I did with the bass to give it some growl. Once I get a sound I'm happy with, I'll turn off my PFL, bring up the channel volume, and have a listen to how it sounds through the main speakers. No matter what your sound source, this is a very typical way that you would use the controls in a channel strip. There's more information on handling different instruments, mics, and singers in the sound check scene and more on the use of EQ and effects in the individual EQ and effects scenes. The whole point of a mixer is to produce a good mix. And a good mix is just that. A good blend of sounds that feels unified and controlled, allowing the audience to enjoy your performance as a whole, not just the performance of a tambourine or the bass guitar. Achieving this involves many things, from the quality of the sound and musicianship coming off stage, to the miking, EQ, to how various instruments are adjusted as the performances take place. As with EQ, less is very often more. If you see an engineer playing with faders like they're some sort of arcade game during the show, you can be pretty certain that there's either something drastically wrong going on, or that they're just a complete novice. One of the ways to minimise obtrusive changes to the levels of individual sounds is to group like-minded sounds or parts together. If, for instance, the drums in general were a bit quiet, you can then gently raise the level of every drum channel using just a single fader. And that's what this fader does here, marked Group 1-2. On the MG-16-4, you place a channel onto a group bus simply by pressing the 1-2 button. You can monitor on headphones what is being sent to the group bus by switching between the group and stereo, i.e. the main stereo outputs, using this switch. And obviously, just because you want to be able to control a group of like-minded instruments as a group, you still want them to go out of the main stereo mix as well. Well, actually, there are times when you want a group submix, as it's often referred to, to be separately controllable. If, for instance, you want to send a group mix out to a recording device. 
This switch allows you to send the group submix to the main stereo bus or not. The MG164 has groups 1 and 2 and just a single fader marked group 1 2. What's the point of having two group channels if you only have one fader, you might ask? As is often the case, the channel's pan control can affect a signal not just left and right, but also to buses 1 and 2. Although you have just a single fader in this instance, there are two independent group output jacks, so you could say, send all the vocals out of group 1 and all the drums out of group 2, just by assigning the channels accordingly using the pan control. Using groups buys you flexibility. We discovered that the AUX buses can be used for patching in effects processors or to set up a separate monitor mix. How does this relate to the AUX send and return knobs here in the master section of the mixer? As you recall, AUX 1 on this mixer can be set to either pre or post fade. In the pre fade position, AUX 1 would be used to feed a monitor mix. Here's how you set it up. On each channel, you control the level going into the monitor mix using the AUX 1 control on its strip. Need more guitar in the monitors? OK, raise the level of the guitar channel's AUX1 knob. Meanwhile, on the master side, the AUX1 send control governs the overall level of the entire monitor mix going out to your monitor amp and speakers. The AUX return control actually operates just like any other input channel, and in fact can be a very useful additional input sometimes, say for a click track or a sequencer signal. And this controls the level of anything currently patched into your mixer via the AUX return. AUX2 here is set to post fade, so this is a bus you'd normally use for the external effects processor. Again, the AUX2 send control governs the strength of signal going into the effects processor, and AUX2 return the strength of affected signal coming back to be added into the main mix. Finally, this knob here marked ST governs the level of AUX1 and 2 that you want going into the main stereo mix, i.e. your out front sound. If you have, say, an external reverb unit patched into AUX2, the beauty of this system is that you can send varying amounts of each input to the reverb via the AUX2 knob on the respective channel. So you can add just a touch of reverb, say, onto the snare drum, and relatively plus to your lead vocal in reverb. I'm not saying you necessarily want to do this, you understand, but you get the general idea. We cover setting up and using external effects processors in detail in its own effects scene. Now you have all of your channels set up and balanced the way you want, the monitors and the effects set up as you like, all that's left to do is adjusting this guy, the main fader, to raise and lower the level of your entire mix as the crowd gets more and more rowdy or just goes home. In this scene we've concentrated on the basics of mixing. There's of course a lot more to learn in terms of mixing as an art and mixing in a variety of settings from a house of worship to a club to a concert. And you can pick up some great tips on mixing by viewing some of the practical application scenes as well. A powered mixer is, as its name suggests, a mixer with a built-in power amplifier. Aside from this obvious blending of features, powered mixers often go on to offer graphic EQ, and even digital effects processing under a single roadworthy roof, as you can see here on the Yamaha EMX68S. Understandably, there's a trade-off between all-in-one labour-saving designs and specific component designs that focus on one thing at a time. But these mixers can still be powerful as well as powered. They're designed to make setup and teardown as quick and easy as possible. Connect your loudspeakers at the back here, plug in your mics and instruments, and your system is basically ready for work. Because it, it, it has reduced the number of pieces that we need instead of having a separate dedicated mixer, a separate dedicated EQ, and then an additional power amp, I now have an all in one package which can make most of these things work. Less connections to make, less setup time, far simpler for the operator. So let's see how the EMX presents its mixer controls in so small amount of space. Inputs. Due to its physical design, Inputs are placed at the bottom rather than the top. Well, you don't want a whole bunch of chords covering up the rest of the channel strip, do you? Out of this mixer's six input channels, four offer a choice of balanced XLR inputs for mics, plus a high and super high Z quarter inch jacks. 
High Z inputs are high impedance inputs that let you plug a guitar or bass straight into the mixer without having to involve a preamp. Here, as opposed to gradual control over the input gain, you simply have a pad switch that cuts the input by 30 dB if your signal is too hot. This is done to reduce setup hassles. On channels 5 and 6 here, you have a simple choice of XLR for mics or quarter inch line level input for synths, drum machines, or other line level devices. On a powered mixer, rather than give you total flexibility on all channels, the designers tend to give you purpose built solutions. Here's how you'd set up a small band using the EMX 68S. And here's how you'd set it up for something like a conference with multiple microphones and recorded music coming off a CD. Moving to the top of the channel strip, we can see that three bands of EQ are offered on all channels. This is a really good idea because powered mixers are probably going to be used in, well, let's say unusual spaces, not just dedicated music venues. So it's very helpful to be able to compensate for things like dead strings or maybe just dead acoustics in a totally carpeted bar or restaurant. In place of open-ended aux bus ends on a channel, like you find on a console-style mixer, here you just have a dedicated monitor control, which really is just an aux end set to pre-fader. And this lets you send the required amount of that instrument to a separate monitor mix and an effect send level fixed as post fader. And this lets you send the required amount of that instrument to the internal effects unit. This is both quick and simple. Moving down, we see a pan control for left right positioning. And in place of a channel fader, space kind of dictates a channel level knob. Over on the right hand master side, the most eye catching controls are a pair of graphic equalizers. One dedicated to the monitor mix, the other for your out front sound. Having this sort of control can be crucial if you're working in a variety of places with strange sound characteristics. If you're surrounded by hard, sound-reflecting windows, or maybe playing at an open-air wedding where the bass just kind of floats off into the ether. Since this is a powered mixer, the front panel also lets you decide how you want your available power to be distributed. Are you using monitors? If not, then you can harness all the available power for the main speakers. Do you need to bridge that system even for more power out of a single mono speaker? Or do you need to connect more speakers or indeed another power amp? Yamaha's powered mixers offer internal effects processing. And here we see a dozen or more classic effects from reverbs to echo effects, chorus, even distortion offered in no-nonsense preset form. And if you do want to plumb in your own favorite piece of outboard gear, you can still do that using these master aux sends and returns. For small club work, especially if you're primarily using a sound reinforcement system to amplify vocals and support just one or two additional instruments like acoustic guitar or flute or upright bass, and especially if you need to run sound and play, having so much control at your fingertips is not only good, it's pretty much essential. At the end of the day, literally, you want to be able to power down, unplug your mics and speakers and have the gear in the back of the van before the last night's audience has found their car keys. And with a powered mixer, you can do just that. A digital mixer is still a mixer. In other words, its basic purpose is the same as any other mixers. To coordinate many different sound sources into one unified mix. The digital part of the equation concerns how this is done, and the control options and flexibility with which it is offered. The advantages of digital equipment is that you can store and recall settings and setups at the touch of a button. Plus, use a computer to provide additional features such as programmability and storage. Looking first at the internal benefits of a digital mixer, although the channel strip would appear to be much like its analogue cousins, there is one major enhancement here. Just because you plug into, say, channel 1 on the mixer, you can actually route that input through any channel you like. The internal routing, in other words, is totally flexible. Additionally, Although you may have the same amount of EQ and effects possibilities as you do on an analog mixer, all of the settings and levels can be recalled at the touch of a button. Right, no more squinting at pieces of paper or trying to remember that great EQ setting you had on your lead singer's mic. And this goes for channel fader positions as well. Yes, very eye-catching, isn't it? Although, as you're probably starting to understand, mixing is more to do with setups and slow movements than rapid changes to your sound. There's no denying, though, the power of being able to recall these settings at the touch of a button. 
Here on the Yamaha 01 V96, for instance, you can recall multiple scenes, complete with effect settings. And this is a wonderful facility to have, especially if you're mixing several bands in one night. But it's also extremely useful for particular effects. A different range of EQs on a ballad, maybe. Finally, the power of signal controlling effects like noise gates and compressors is undeniable, but also so is the expense of purchasing several noise gates or compressors, which is what you'll need to do for every channel on an analog mixer on which you'd like to apply these effects. Not the case here. A noise gate and compressor limiter is available on every single input channel. You can imagine, and the smart ones I'm sure can work it out for themselves, the cost saving on this alone. A digital mixer is not just a sealed unit. Its very digital nature allows you to interface with computers both for storage and recall of data and for on-screen control, such as here with the one v 96s Studio Manager software that replicates and in fact expands upon the controls and functionality of the one v itself. If you're travelling light, you could, for instance, simply carry your settings on your laptop and download them into the mixer provided by the venue anywhere in the world. Plus, there's a whole range of expansion cards that let you add new features and new functionality. Affordable digital mixers were pioneered by Yamaha, and they continue to come in all shapes, sizes and prices, right up to the PM1D that we can see installed here at the Cerritos Performing Arts Centre in California. But they all have this in common. Take the fun and games you can have with any mixer, and then add the almost limitless flexibility that you can get by throwing computer control into the mix. The purpose of a power amplifier is to make sound louder. To some extent, it's as simple as that. A well-made and probably more costly amplifier will amplify sound better and be less distorted than a less expensive unit. And a bigger, in terms of output power, amplifier will amplify sound louder than an amplifier with a lower rating. So what's the mystery? What are the issues? Well, one issue is that people tend not to realise how important amplification is. A good power amplifier will make your sound clean, clear and punchy, make it come alive. An inexpensive amplifier, or one that's not compatible with the rest of your system, can make your sound weak and dull, or at worst, completely fail to operate. You'll find this usually happens right in the middle of your performance. And after all the work you did learning how to play your instrument and learning the songs. Yep, amplification is that important. Power amplifiers are not the stuff of dreams in the looks department. Here you have a power switch, a series of LEDs to warn you about the temperature of the amp and whether it's in protection mode to prevent overheating or damage to your loudspeakers. A typical two-channel amp has attenuators for each of the amp's A and B channels, plus other LEDs for clipping and signal, i.e. is it on? Finally, you can see air intake grills for the forced air cooling system. From this, you can probably see that heat is obviously a key issue for a power amplifier. Indeed, any electrical device that generates power, from a power amplifier to a light bulb, generates heat as a byproduct. This heat is unavoidable, but it is the sworn enemy of the electronic circuits in the amplifier, so dealing with this heat is extremely important. In the first place, Yamaha designs its amplifiers to be as efficient as possible to reduce heating. But by properly matching the amplifier to the loudspeakers it'll be driving, you'll definitely be able to avoid trouble. Let's back up a minute and look at the causes of this heat. The key parameter of a power amp is its power output rating, basically how loud it'll go. Power rating is measured in watts, but wattage is only part of the picture. 200 watts may be twice the electrical power of 100 watts, but actually loudness or acoustic power follows a logarithmic scale, meaning every time you double the volume, a 10 times increase in electrical power is required. So to double the volume difference of 100 watts, you would actually need 1000 watts, which is why there are so many high-powered amplifiers to choose from. The delivery of power is one thing. How loudspeakers receive and handle that power is the other factor you have to consider. And this is a question of the impedance of the loudspeaker, which is measured in units called ohms. The relationship between watts and ohms sounds like a detective story, doesn't it? Not only determines how loud your system will be, but also whether or not your amplifier's heating will be manageable. Impedance is a measure of resistance that the loudspeaker system presents to the amplifier. 
Higher impedance will translate to lower wattage, while lower impedance means higher wattage. A lot of amplifier advertisements, you see, have power ratings done at very low impedances, which makes it look good on paper, but actually is pretty misleading about the actual usable power that you're going to have at your disposal. So why not have all loudspeakers running at super low impedances? As with most things in life, there is a balance. If the loudspeakers have impedance ratings that are too low, the amplifier might not be able to effectively power the system without generating too much of its number one enemy, heat. And if the impedance is too high, the path the signal flows through will be too restricted. All of the professional loudspeaker systems that Yamaha makes have nominal impedances of either 4 or 8 ohms, and that makes them perfect for use with most of the amplifiers on the market today, and we'll cover them later in the program. As a matter of fact, most professional sound companies do not operate systems with impedances of less than 4 ohms, again, mainly to avoid the heating and risk of failure. If we were to measure a piece of wire with a meter, we would show zero ohms, it'd be a dead short, it would go right through. A speaker, typically the one I'm talking about, has 8 ohms, so it has some resistance. If I put an 8 ohm speaker next to an 8 ohm speaker and I put them in parallel, I'm going to get a 4 ohm load, which means it's going to be closer to a dead short than just the one 8 ohm speaker. So can I put two speakers on, a, on an amplifier? Sure. Can I put more? Can I put three? Can I put four? Why not put 20? Well, the more speakers I put on there, obviously the closer I approach that zero or that dead short. If I take two 8 ohm speakers and I put them together, I have a 4 ohm load. If I take two more 8 ohm speakers and I have this 4 ohm load and I put them together, I'm going to get a 2 ohm load. Right. If I do it again, I'm going to drop down, you know, and so forth and so on. I see. You're never going to get to zero, but you're going to get close. The amplifier, as you drop the impedance, increases in operating temperature and it also increases its distortion. Most amplifiers are designed to do you know, four or eight ohms. So the closer I get to this you know, zero point, which theoretically can't happen, the more distortion I'm gonna get and it's, the amplifier is running quite a bit more unstably than it otherwise would. So you want to avoid two ohm loads, you really do. Amps come in two basic flavors single channel and two channel. And a two channel amp can use their two channels in a few different ways. One, in stereo mode. This powers a full left right system, or as two individual mono amps, one say for your main speakers and the other for your monitor system. Two, in parallel. This is where one input signal is fed to both amplifier channels. Use this to send the same signal to two different loudspeaker systems and still use the attenuators for level control. 3. Bridge mode, where each channel's power is combined into one giant mono output, effectively doubling the power being delivered to a single set of outputs. This mode is generally used for subwoofers and large speaker systems. Is that the end of the story? Not quite. One amplifier will not necessarily do everything you need. If you're running a full monitor system, for instance, you'll probably want to use a separate amp channel to power it. Also, if you're running a multiple speaker setup, like main speakers plus subwoofers, you'll need separate amplification for each, plus another piece of equipment called a crossover. A crossover is a series of filters that splits a full range signal into different frequency bands that loudspeakers are designed to reproduce. Some loudspeaker units have what's called a passive crossover, already built into them, and that distributes its signals to its low and high frequency drivers and horns respectively. And we'll look at these more closely in the loudspeaker scene. An active crossover, on the other hand, as its name implies, gives you control over the frequency ranges that are being sent to each of the components. In other words, your subwoofers just get the lows, and your mains just the mids and highs. Some amplifiers, like the Yamaha P-Series, have an active crossover built in. This kind of saves both money and cabling hassles. Here on the Yamaha P3500S, you can see these crossover style filtering controls at the back. Amplifiers don't produce power. They convert power from an AC outlet. High powered amplifiers can draw large amounts of AC power, so be sure to use heavy cabling and avoid power strips as these will limit the amount of current available to the amplifier. Make sure amplifiers don't overheat. 
and that they have plenty of ventilation. Remember, heat is enemy number one for power amplifiers. Drive amps hard, but not to the max. Professional power amplifiers are made to deliver a very high output. An occasional clip light flashing is your indication that you've reached that maximum output of the amplifier. Distortion damages. Damages your speakers, your ears, and is pretty hard on the audience's ears as well. Avoid this by controlling your maximum output levels. Don't skimp on cabling. Use large gauge wiring to assure that all the power the amplifier provides actually goes to the loudspeaker. You should also eliminate excessive extra length. If your cables are too long, you're wasting some of that power that could be getting to the loudspeaker. We always try to minimize the amount of cable between the speaker and the amplifier because they sound better. There's no reason to waste your amplifier power heating up the copper in the cable. You want to basically get your amplifiers as close to the speakers as you can. Sometimes when you can't, you need to use the 150s, but anytime you can use the 5 or the 10 footers, it's really the best thing to do. EQ is short for equalization, a term and a technique that sprang out of the early telephone industry, where the technology affected certain frequencies in a voice, and a way of returning those frequencies to their more natural, equal state became necessary. Strangely enough, although a whole industry has grown up around equalization in sound reinforcement, it's still quite helpful to keep in mind this original purpose, to make electronically delivered sound more natural and more lifelike. At its simplest, EQ is just treble and bass controls, like you'd find on a basic home stereo system. Here on the MG164 mixer, these tone controls have slightly more sophisticated names, high and low, along with control over mid. These names refer to a particular range of audio frequencies, and the knobs let you boost or cut the level of high, low or mid-range frequencies that are present in any sound going through the channel, so altering the tonal characteristics. Actually, these knobs control filters that let certain frequencies in a sound pass through unaffected, while homing in on other frequencies and allowing you to make them louder or softer. It may seem obvious, but one of the first lessons to learn about EQ is that not all frequencies are present in every sound. Sure, you can hear the changes to a guitar when we adjust the high EQ, but apply the same changes to a bass or a kick drum and there's not that much difference because neither of these sounds contain many high frequencies in the first place. Lesson, you can only boost or cut frequencies that are actually contained in the sound. There aren't too many EQ parameters to remember or learn about. There's the choice of the frequency itself, then there's how much you boost or cut that frequency, and in more elaborate consoles you'll find a Q control, which varies how wide or narrow the band of frequencies the EQ will affect. We've seen and heard how cutting or boosting high, mid or low frequencies on the MG164 affects different sounds. And while this EQ is good, here you are limited to the particular frequency that the designers have designated as high, mid or low. In other words, you can't change them on this mixer, and nor can you change how narrow or broad the tonal adjustment is going to be. If you need more precise EQ control, you'll want to use an external device such as this a graphic equaliser, or this, a parametric equaliser. A graphic equaliser allows you to cut or boost very narrow frequency ranges. Say your sound system, combined with the venue you're playing in, has an unpleasant ring to it. A graphic equaliser makes it easy to find that specific frequency, and then adjust it down a little to get rid of it, and doing this without affecting the sound of other instruments and voices that you're reinforcing. Well, how do you find the offending frequency? Oddly enough, the best way is to first try and make the ring worse to confirm the problem, and then make your adjustment. Boost the frequency levels until you can isolate what's causing the problem. Then when you cut that particular frequency, you eliminate the problem. Most digital stereo systems nowadays have settings that the manufacturer has decided are good for specific types of music, a rock setting or a classical setting. For rock and hip-hop, you probably want the overall sound to feel powerful and loud. And EQ can help you achieve this by adding some boost to the lowest frequencies. A typical graphic equaliser setting would be what's called a smile, i.e. 
boosting both the low and the high end in a gradual natural curve. The most sophisticated type of EQ device is this, what's called a parametric equaliser. Like the graphic equaliser, you can select different frequencies to operate on, but you can also change the focus or width of frequencies being altered. This additional parameter, hence the name, is called the Q, and it can be set to narrow, a high numeric value, where the focus is very specific to a certain range of frequencies, or wide, a low number where the adjustment will also take in a fairly broad range of frequencies on either side. This is the most accurate type of equaliser, but its operation is quite a bit more complex and you'll need to practice to learn how to use these filters properly. Here are a few tips to help you avoid some of the common mistakes when it comes to using EQ. 1. EQ is a practiced art, not a science. Time and careful listening can make you an expert. Learn to listen with your eyes, that is scan the stage with your eyes while listening carefully to make sure that you can hear all the instruments and the voices that you're seeing. 2. Follow the rule, he who EQs least, EQs best. Before you start twisting EQ controls to fix the sound, make sure to check that the microphone and microphones are positioned properly and that you have the right type for the sounds that you want to amplify. Often. This will go way further than all the knob twisting in the world. 3. Keep in mind that EQ adjustments you make need to be made in the context of the overall mix. In other words, sometimes you need to make adjustments to create space so that all the instruments can be heard. A good example of this is that a guitar might need to be EQ'd in order to leave room for a vocalist. They both use the same relative frequencies, and so adjusting the EQ to thin the guitar would actually help the vocals. 4. Before you make drastic EQ changes to your overall sound, walk around the venue to see if the problem occurs everywhere, or just where you happen to have the mixer set up. Not only will this help you hear what the audience is hearing, it also shows the performers that you're willing to make the extra effort to get the sound perfect. If, during the performance, you experience the ringing mentioned before, you are being warned that you've reached a point called maximum acoustic gain meaning that you cannot increase the volume any further in the system. You need to decrease the output level of the system until the ringing, which is obviously a big distraction to your audience, subsides, and then work on the problem later without the audience. The only thing more distracting than the ringing is you trying to fix it. You may have too many microphones turned on, improperly aimed, or simply the wrong mic for the job. Check it out after the performance. Hey, 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 one, two, that's great. If you put a mic in front of a singer and simply record it, or put it straight through your sound reinforcement system, that's what's called a raw, unprocessed signal. But there's lots you can do to both colour and process that signal before the audience actually gets to hear it. You can get rid of unwanted background noise, you can add reverb to it, make it punchier, add some echo, maybe even make it sound like it's been generated by a synthesizer. All such things, we tend to lump under the heading of adding effects. Effects are tools. Sometimes you'll find a range of them built into the mixer. Sometimes you'll need to purchase and plug in a specific effects processor. Effects can broadly be divided up into two categories. Signal controlling effects and signal processing effects. And in fact, signal processing can be further divided up into special effects and spatial effects. Signal controlling effects are simply used to manage sound. Why does sound need managing? Well, say you want to make a sound more consistent in volume. Minimise the peaks and troughs. Effects that squeeze or compress the dynamic range of a signal in order to do this are called compressors. Or perhaps you want to be safe and put an absolute limit on the level of a sound in order to safeguard against overloading, something that could certainly severely damage your equipment. In this case, you would use a limiter. Perhaps there's a bunch of other noise or audio going on around the sound you want to amplify. No problem. There are devices that employ an electronic gate that opens to let your sound through 
and then closes as soon as it goes below a certain level in order to keep out that background noise. And these are called noise gates. Hey, finally we've come across a whole range of sound reinforcement equipment that actually has names that mean something. Without a compressor, you can always do this. That's right. The job of a compressor is to smooth out inconsistencies in level. And you could, if you're extremely quick, do what's called ride the gain. Alternatively, when it comes to compressing vocals, you could just hope that you have a real pro singer with a great mic technique. An actual compressor is probably a safer bet though. Compressors are connected directly to the channel or signal that you want to compress. The nature of the effect is such that every sound that needs compressing should have its own compressor or compressor channel because the settings need to be adjusted individually to suit that particular sound. The first adjustment to make is the threshold, the level above which you'd like to hear your sound to be reduced in volume. In effect, this is like an engineer yanking down the fader every time he sees the signal go above a certain point. OK, but how far down is he yanking that fader? On a compressor, this is stated as ratio. A 2 to 1 setting will make a 2 dB increase in the sound only increase by 1 dB. This would be called fairly gentle compression. And this would be a good starting point for a vocalist. A 6 to 1 ratio, on the other hand, will produce considerably greater level squashing. You might use a setting like this with a kick drum to make a punchier sound. So we've seen the when, and by how much, how about the how fast? Depending upon the model, you may also have control over how fast compression is initiated, governed by the attack control, and how fast normal uncompressed levels will resume, governed by the release control. A fast attack is probably best with a vocal, where you want to keep the sound as natural as possible. If you're compressing a kick drum though, you might want a slower attack, so the percussive front end of the sound still has time to be heard before the compression actually kicks in. If a signal seems to be pumping, or you can hear the gain being adjusted by the compressor, your release time is probably too short. These are just the basics of using a compressor. There's a lot more to learn, and a lot of good material out there on the web or in book form to turn you into an expert. If you set a really high ratio on a compressor, say 15 to 1 or something, you are in effect putting up a brick wall against signal overload, and this is then called limiting. Sometimes a limiter is built into an amp or a powered mixer. You can also find dedicated standalone limiters, and certainly there are quite a few limiter plugins on the market for studio use, but most likely you'll find limiting facilities for live sound on one compressor limiter unit. Compressor limiters are generally connected to an individual channel. Large touring rigs encompass a range of effects from compression and limiting to EQ that would be applied to the mix as a whole. This has a dual function, both as a safeguard against dangerous level spikes that could damage loudspeakers and as a fine-tuning device to tailor a mix for a particular room or setting. Effects for this purpose will be connected in line between your mixer's output and your amplifier's input. Let's face it, playing music at all takes skill. Playing music in front of a live audience throws a whole army of additional problems into the mix, some mechanical, some ergonomic, some just visual. We're talking about extraneous noise, be it mic handling noise, wind at an outdoor gig, bleed from a neighbouring sound source, or even just a squeaky kick drum pedal. All of these can make a mix sound muddy or muffled. This extraneous noise is not something you want in a live mix, and a noise gate will help you get rid of it. Similar to a compressor, a noise gate is connected in line via a channel insert and has a threshold setting that determines the level below which the gate will close and no sound whatsoever will come out of that channel. So let's take a vocal mic and a general on-stage sound as an example. When the singer is singing, you don't notice it at all. But when they're not singing, you really don't want an open mic on stage. Set the threshold on your gate so that when it is only hearing the indirect stage sound, it'll close down, resulting in total silence on that channel. When the singer starts up again, the threshold will be exceeded and the gate will open back up and let the sound pass. 
Again, similar to a limiter, you'll generally find control over attack and release, so that the effect can appear to happen naturally. In particular, if the release is too short, then a nice slow fading sustain on a guitar, or a trail of a cymbal hit, could get cut off abruptly. Signal processing effects actually alter the sound itself. This can either be through spatial effects, where a sound can be made to seem as if it's being played in a range of different spaces, like a stadium or a concert hall, or an echo chamber. Or it can be through the use of a special effect that fundamentally alters the sound itself, like a chorus, flange, or a dramatic synthesizer pitch effect that you tend to hear on a lot of dance music at the moment. If you're recording, this is a huge area to learn about, but for live sound, this is not quite as pressing a concern, for two reasons. Spatial effects can be crucial in a recording because you want to create an atmosphere in which the music is seemingly taking place. Well, live it is taking place, and the reverberations and reflections that signal processors are recreating for you on record are quite often present and correct because your sound really is bouncing off walls and ceilings in a venue. So adding more reverb may only muddy your sound and make it less intelligible or less easy to understand. As for special effects, these are mainly applied to the sound of a specific instrument or part. So you're off the hook here as well, since the guitarist or keyboard player will probably be capable of, and indeed want to apply, these for themselves. For these reasons, we'll be keeping this part of our voyage of discovery fairly short. The most common spatial effect is reverb. Without any effect, or dry as engineers call it, the vocal is very present, very intimate, but also quite naked and unforgiving. Add reverb to a sound and it seems to be more natural, as it sounds as if it's been sung in an actual environment. It also sounds a bit more polished because you can't distinguish every little fluctuation and deviation in the performance. Now the sound will be called wet with reverb. Vocalists love reverb. Reverb units are generally patched into an aux bus on your mixing desk, so that any channel can share the effect. This way, all the different sources will sound as if they're coming from the same environment, making the sound more natural and believable. While each channel can use different amounts of reverb, it's important to understand that you can only use one setting or patch on the reverb unit at a time. The moral of this story is to look for a setting that will suit a wide variety of sounds. Yamaha has been producing excellent digital reverb units for a great many years now. You can, as many people do, simply flip through the presets and find a general tone of reverb that suits your particular purpose or venue. If you're playing in the Spectrum in Philly, you probably won't need a very long reverb time. The Spectrum Bar and Grill, that only holds 150 people, well, yes, you probably can afford to use longer times to create the illusion of playing in a basketball stadium. Avoid using reverb on sources that don't benefit from the effect. An example would be a bass guitar or a kick drum. These sounds would only be muddied. A good rule is that higher frequency sources like a snare drum, vocals or a cymbal are candidates that would benefit from reverb. Delay effects are actually very closely related to reverb, but where reverbs don't tend to have defined repeats or echoes, that's exactly what you want in a delay. You want the snare to sound and then here in probably decreasing volume and preferably in time with the beat of your song. Some singers use a trademark echo or delay, 1950s slapback echo for instance, and sometimes a song or even a style of music like Jamaican dub demand the use of delays. These are perfectly legitimate applications. But in general, it's best not to smother your mix with delays, as it can get quite wearing on the ears. Although most special effects like chorus or flanging will be applied by a player on stage, occasionally you may need to pull something out of the hat yourself. Some chorusing on a vocal, or the aforementioned synthesizer vocal pitch effect. Depending upon the size of your system, you may want to plug in a multi-effects processor in line on a channel. Or you may have enough AUX buses that you can afford to simply use one just for the occasional special effect. Music 
Is it worth spending money buying the dedicated effects units as opposed to using the effects that might already be built into your mixer? That's a difficult one. And in fact, the answer is made even more difficult when you consider digital mixers. If you're running a small rig with a powered mixer, like the EMX68S, that will deliver all the reverb and delays and special effects that you're realistically going to need. Plus, it has an effects bypass jack, so that you can use a foot switch to mute the effect when you don't need it. This is all excellent if you're mixing yourself. Leapfrog up to a medium priced digital mixer like the O1 V96, and not only have you got four super high quality signal processing effects built in, you can also apply digital compression, limiting and even noise gates on every single channel. Imagine the cost of buying, say, 16 individual pieces of equipment. So this is going to be a massive cost saving. If you're using a more modest featured analog mixing desk, then a top quality dedicated reverb unit can give your sound a coating of quality that makes complete economic sense. When people think about sound reinforcement systems, this is what mainly comes to mind. Loudspeakers, and lots of them. Loudspeakers are actually just the final link in a chain of command that begins with instruments and voices being converted into electrical signals by microphones and instrument amps. These individual sounds were then channeled into a mixer for processing and blending, and then the unified mix was fed into an amplifier. What turns all this back into stuff you can hear, i.e. back into acoustic energy, are loudspeakers. What do you really need to know about loudspeakers? Without wishing to minimise the incredible science of loudspeaker design, basically three things. What's in them? What's driving them? Where you put them? In other words, this scene is just going to explore what makes loudspeakers tick, and what you really need to know and what you can do to get the best out of them. Sound is produced by waves or audio frequencies of many different lengths, from the highs of a triangle to the lows of a bass synth. The human ear interprets these as sound. Frequencies that come as a series of fast, repeating patterns we interpret as high-pitched sound, and those that come as a series of slow, repeating patterns as low-pitched sounds. Waves with large peaks and troughs we hear as loud, frequencies that are more ripple than something you'd want to surf on, as quiet. In the microphone scene, we saw how transducers convert acoustic energy into electrical energy. So, to answer the first question, what's in a loudspeaker? The main element in a loudspeaker is the driver, which is also a transducer. Only this time, the transducer converts electrical energy back into acoustic energy. These drivers are then mounted into speaker cabinets or enclosures. Simple. Mm, well, not quite, unfortunately. Obviously you want your audience to hear everything, from the high highs of a ride cymbal to the thump of a kick drum. The problem is that individual drivers are really only capable of producing something in the region of a three octave range of frequencies. A single driver is then not going to cut it if you want to deliver a full rich sound that covers the complete audio spectrum. The answer is to use several drivers, each tailored to reproduce a certain slice of that audio spectrum. Sometimes you'll find two or more drivers in a single enclosure, then referred to as a two-way or three-way design. And in more sophisticated sound reinforcement systems, you may find several different enclosures, each containing a specific type of driver, like these subwoofer cabs. There are also, it has to be said, many different types of cabinet, from designs where the drivers are pointing straight out, mounted in essentially a simple empty enclosure, to ones where sound is reflected within the cabinet or even travelling through a whole series of chambers before being projected out beyond the speaker grill. We'll let these individual designs convince you, or not, as to whether their particular stylings will do the best job for you. And don't be afraid by this. No one design is best. Sound, as can so many other things in life, can be delivered in a great many ways. Whether you're using single cabs with multiple drivers, or multiple cabinets with individual sized drivers, what you are trying to achieve is a balanced and complete representation of the audio picture. Sound travels in waves or cycles, and in order to reproduce low frequencies, you need to move a lot of air. Putting a deep bass synth through the system, you can actually see air being moved, whereas there's very little coming out of the drivers that handle high frequencies. 
and indeed a high frequency sound like a triangle or hi-hat hardly comes through the woofer at all. Drivers designed to handle low lows are normally referred to as subwoofers. What else is there? Drivers designed to handle general low end frequencies are just called woofers. A mid range driver delivers mid range frequencies, and so named tweeters take care of the high highs. Looking at tweeters in a bit more detail, a smaller driver can deliver high frequencies more efficiently than a larger one. But since these smaller drivers can't produce sound levels equal to the acoustic output of low frequency drivers, a horn is generally mated to the high frequency driver to concentrate and control the acoustic energy it produces. Different driver sizes are best for reproducing different audio frequencies. And rather than send out a blanket of frequencies to all of the speakers, a type of filter called a crossover sends specific frequency bands of the signal to the most appropriate driver. Depending upon the system, or the crossover, you may have more or less control over which range of frequencies cross over to the next speaker in your system. Crossovers come in all shapes and sizes. Some are built into the loudspeaker enclosure, which you then have little control over. These are called passive crossovers. Yamaha uses these in the Club Series and BR Series full-range loudspeakers, simplifying setup and operation. Others might be built into the amplifier, offering some adjustment as to where in the audio spectrum a sound is being divided. Or, on a large system, you'll probably find a separate electronic crossover, which is plumbed into the system between the mixer and the power amplifier. These are known as active crossovers. Just imagine the same simple speaker system, the 18, the 8, and the tweeter, as opposed to having one amplifier driving those, we have three amplifiers that see a crossover before that. So there's one amplifier that sees just powers just the 18, the other amplifier powers just the 8 inch speaker, and another powers just the tweeter. You can imagine the low end is going to take the most power, the mid range is going to take slightly less, and the tweeter is going to take slightly less than that. The second of our initial questions about loudspeakers is what's driving them, and the answer to that is an amplifier. Unless you're using a set of powered speakers, i.e. speakers with a built-in amplifier, it's crucial that your amplifier and speakers are compatible in terms of the amplifier's power output and the speaker's power handling. Yes, it's our old friends Watts and Ohms again, and the whole question of impedance. But first, how do you measure power? Yamaha provides three power ratings for loudspeakers, noise, program and peak. The reason for these ratings is to allow you, the user, to properly put the actual wattage rating into perspective. The noise rating is the amount of power the loudspeaker system can handle if pure white noise, like you hear in between radio stations when you tune a radio, is applied continuously for a period of eight hours without any signs of abuse or damage. Clearly, this is a torture test. The next power rating is program, which is a more real-world measurement, more representative of real music and speech. Use this rating to determine the acceptable power output of the amplifier you'll need to use with this loudspeaker. Lastly, there is peak power, which is the highest power the loudspeaker can handle momentarily. Operation at these high ratings continuously will certainly damage the loudspeaker system, but it can occasionally accept this power level. What does all this mean in practice? It means that in order to get the best out of the sound reinforcement system, you need to use the appropriate loudspeakers for the amount of power being sent out by the amplifiers. And it means you need to use the appropriately powered complete system for the type of work that you're going to be doing. OK, so what's appropriate? A little known fact about sound reinforcement is that underpowering, or using an amplifier that's too small, damages more loudspeakers than using one that's too large. So, use great care when matching your speakers and amplifiers. The third question we said needed looking at is where the loudspeakers are going to be placed. Sound, as anyone can tell you who's had their party shut down by police after complaints from residents six blocks away, can travel in long and mysterious ways. How sound travels is called dispersion and it's both an interesting and extremely important thing to consider for a number of reasons. The process starts with the design of the loudspeakers themselves. Notice how this high frequency horn is flared. This helps the sound develop while controlling dispersion. Next issue is how you position the cabinets to give as many people in the audience a balanced and blended sound. 
To make the whole procedure as natural as possible for the audience, loudspeakers are normally positioned beside or sometimes above the stage so that the final sound appears to be coming from the stage in one unified direct package. Placement is key to getting the best coverage with the least amount of wasted amplifier power. You need to aim loudspeakers directly at the intended audience. Doing this will avoid two major pitfalls. One, using too much volume, and two, causing intelligibility problems. Often, novice sound people will immediately go for the master fader on the console when audience members complain they can't hear. This actually might be the very reason for the complaints in the first place. As the sound person, it's your job to understand that the I can't hear complaint from an audience member is more likely I can't understand. This is a common problem in houses of worship, where the audience tends to be a bit older and may be beginning to suffer the early effects of hearing loss. Turning up the sound in a room with a poorly designed or installed sound system is like throwing a rock in a pool of water. The air just becomes full of sound waves travelling in every direction. So how does this relate to loudspeakers? Since the loudspeaker is the place in the system that the signal is actually converted back into acoustic energy, it is also the place where you have at least some control over where this energy gets put into the environment. If you're looking to install a system permanently in a space, you should contact an audio contractor or consultant to help you make the right decisions. And before you do this, why not visit venues that are similar to yours and find out who worked on their systems? Well, provided you liked what you heard, of course. If you're either using a different system every night, or using the same system in a different environment every night, we have plenty of tips on maximising your sound and troubleshooting in the Golden Rules scene. Use speaker cable and don't skimp on it. Loudspeakers are connected to amplifiers using speaker cabling. Even if it can sometimes use a quarter inch jack connector, this is not the same as an instrument cable. Use good, thick cable and use a shorter length of cabling as your environment can tolerate. You want to position your power amplifiers as close as you can to the speakers without them being intrusive. We always try to minimize the amount of cable between the speaker and the amplifier because they sound better. There's no reason to waste your amplifier power heating up the copper in the cable. You want to basically get your amplifiers as close to the speakers as you can. Sometimes when you can't, you need to use the one with these, but anytime you can use the 5 or the 10 footers, it's really the best thing to do. So to close, here are one or two specific tips on loudspeakers. One, when setting up your loudspeakers, make sure they are secure and don't wobble or rattle. Keep cabs that are being placed together nice and tight. Two, if you want to increase the effectiveness of a subwoofer, move it over to where the side wall meets the floor, better yet, the corner of a room. Since this is a place where 90 degree triangles start in the room, you have the start of a large horn. This little trick can be as powerful as doubling your amplifier power. 3. Protect your speakers. Loudspeakers do not appreciate loud audio spikes. Make sure the level controls on your connected amps and mixer are down before you power up or power down. And remember, amps should always be switched on last and turned off first. 4. If your drivers are unavoidably exposed to moisture, do not use them at all until they are thoroughly dried out and preferably checked out. We've looked at all the controls contained in a variety of mixers, and we've looked at how a mixer fits into the complete sound reinforcement picture. Now we get to the fun stuff, where all of this raw material gets connected, and all of the individual sounds from your mics and instruments are assembled into a unified mix for your audience to hear. The Geyser Stop Music Festival in Northern California is the venue we've chosen to put all of our explorations into sound reinforcement to the test. A real gig with real issues and a wide variety of real players and a real audience. Planning is everything. Before you even put the equipment in the van, you need to figure out what you're gonna need for the show and the venue in question, basically how big of a system, and then figure out how you're going to set that system up. Most importantly, make sure you have all the cables you need in order to do so. In fact, it's a good idea to throw in some extra cables. The venue we've chosen for this connecting up the system scene is an outdoor festival where several very diverse bands and musicians are going to be performing. 
The space is fairly small, and around 300 people are expected. Here's the equipment we've chosen for the job. Two Yamaha P3500S power amps. One Yamaha P5000S power amp. Two Yamaha SW118 subwoofers. Two Yamaha S115 main speakers. Two Yamaha SM12 monitor wedges. A Yamaha MG324 mixer, which is an expanded version of the mixer we used during the main mixer scene in this program. An effects rack and a whole heap of cables. Even at the most bizarre of venues, essentially the stage will be at one end and the audience at the other. Having schlepped the gear out of the van, place the speakers loosely where you need them on either side of the stage. The mixer needs to be in a place where the engineer can both see and hear the stage well, but also be as unobtrusive to the audience as possible. If you're going to be using monitor speakers, place them alongside each performer that needs them. Power amps should be placed close to the speakers to keep the cable run short. Make sure the amps are accessible, but don't interfere with the performers on the stage. Once your speakers, monitors, and power amps are in place, it's time to start hooking up the cables. Hook the speaker cables up between the power amps and the speakers, and between the power amp and the monitors. Once those are done, it's time to bring out the snake. A snake is just a series of cables bound together that give you a series of sends, that is cables that carry signals from the stage to the mixer, and then a series of returns, cables for getting signals from the mixer back to the stage, like your main and monitor mix. A big advantage of using the snake is that all your cables are housed in a single, larger cable that's easily run from the stage to the mixer, and it's easy to tape to the floor to keep people from tripping over it. Hook the returns from your mixer to the main power amps and the power amp you're using for your monitors. Depending on the kind of snake you end up using, these connections will either be balanced XLR cables or quarter-inch line cables. Once your returns are set, the next step is get your mics out and set up on stage. Place your vocal mics in the general area where your singers will be, right by the monitors. The mics get patched into the snake head using XLR cables. This process is repeated as the rest of the band gets set up. Take your mics from the drums and the guitarist and patch them into the snake, as well as instrument feeds from your bass player and keyboard player. Now that you're all cabled up, we can switch everything on and start testing. To the untrained observer, a sound check is just an excuse for various members of the road crew to strut about on stage before the show going one, two, two, one, into the mics. But that's actually just the tip of this particular iceberg. A sound check, as its name implies, is a critically important time for the person operating the out front sound and the musicians on stage, and yes, even if you're one and the same person, to make sure everything is sounding as it should in order to produce a great show. We've already looked at the controls in a typical channel strip, and we've seen how these are used in practice. Now we're going to look at a whole range of different instruments and sound sources, and see how these will be handled during the sound check.
How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. How I... There are few more thankless tasks than being a professional monitor engineer. If you do your job perfectly, no one notices. If you mess up, or more to the point, if a performer messes up, it's the monitor engineer who gets it in the neck and becomes the world's biggest bad guy for the night. Monitoring is all about letting performers on stage hear what they're doing so that they can perform well. And to say this is a delicate balance of both technology and psychology it's a bit like saying talking politics or religion with people you don't know can be awkward. Ideally, each musician on stage needs their own monitor mix. One person may want to hear predominantly their own vocal with just a tiny bit of everything else, plus say some guitar to fill out the sound. Another musician may want lots of keyboards and a fairly even balance of all the vocals. Unless you're playing large venues, where there actually is a separate monitor console at the side of the stage, your ability to deliver a separate monitor mix for each performer depends on how many separate monitor or auxiliary buses there are on your mixer. If you need three individual monitor mixes, you'll need three individual monitor or aux buses. As we saw in the mixer scene, you set up a monitor mix using the prefade aux bus, the mix itself governed by how much of each channel you send to that particular aux bus. A stage environment can be fairly hostile to the controlled delivery and reception of sound because performers need to be able to move about the stage. And doing so can dramatically change the blend of what they're hearing with each step. Not only that, what they need to hear can change from song to song, and indeed from night to night depending on what and how the rest of the players are playing. This is all tricky stuff and frankly it's safe to say there's no such thing as the perfect type of monitoring system. So from our choices of imperfect systems, let's start at the most commonly used, floor monitors, or as they're sometimes called, stage wedges. Wedges are relatively inexpensive. They're easy to move about, and they're simple to operate. These Yamaha SM12V monitors use a 12-inch driver and a 2-inch compression driver mounted in a base reflex type enclosure. The flared horn will give you plenty of cut and good dispersion. Even so, positioning is crucial. Try to position them so they don't point directly into the microphones, in which case they'd cause feedback. If you can, in fact, point them towards the dead spot of a cardioid pattern mic. Whereas stage wedges operate at a volume level suitable for one performer at a time, side fills operate on the principle of providing general coverage. In other words, a general level of sound to the stage that can be heard by anyone and everyone. Side fills are mainly used today on stages where there's lots of movement, high dancers or just very animated performers. The problem with side fills is that their mix obviously has to be general rather than specific, and also that they can, unless you're very careful, create a high level of on-stage sound that will bleed into microphones and make it very tough to control the out-front sound. And what is a side fill? Side fills can be pretty well any type of large, full-range PA cabinet. Finally, we come to these guys, so named in-ear monitors. This takes personal monitoring to the ultimate height, where not only can you be supplied with a crisp and clear mix that you, and only you, can hear, but it also creates your own personal universe. In-ears are great for keeping stage volumes at an all-time low, but not everyone feels comfortable wearing them. In-ears are increasingly popular with professionals who really know how to use them. Uh, there are some problems with in-ears. It is not a cure-all. Um, as an example, uh, people when they put in in-ears become, they feel masked. They feel like they're in a, um, a fishbowl. So in order to help them with that, you're going to have to add microphones like uh, ambient mics so that you get the room and the crowd to come back in. Uh, things that weren't needed to be mic before might need to be mic now. 
uh, things like, uh, I don't know, uh, electric guitar, all of a sudden, acoustically, you could hear it perfectly. But when you put in in-ears, now you can't hear it as well. So now you may need to add that into your monitors to hear them. Monitoring is an intensely personal issue. A monological application of available technology is to put the mix back in the hands of the performer with so-named personal monitor mixers. People have been trying to perfect these for many years now. If nothing else, it at least takes some of the heat off the often hapless monitor engineer. But you have to wonder whether performers on stage are best left to the art of performing as opposed to the more cerebral art of mixing. A good starting point for setting up your monitor system is to turn it all off. That's right, turn it off. And allow the musicians to adjust their placement and levels of their instruments to hear and interact with each other without the benefit of a monitor system. Then add in the monitors as needed for help. An added benefit is a lower stage volume allowing a clearer out front sound. Start mixing monitors is I stand at the position of the person I'm going to mix for. So if I'm going to do a bass mix as an example, I stand with the bass player and I listen to what he's hearing acoustically. If he's, if he's got enough drums and he's got enough keyboards already, there's no sense in adding that back in his mix. And stand and listen at each individual player on stage's position to see what they need. Because an artist will tell you, I want to hear everything. And that doesn't mean you put everything in their mix. What that means is you add to their mix what you will make a full blend of sound for them at that position. So that's the first thing. Walk around on stage, learn everybody's environment. No monitor system is foolproof. And once the show is in progress, a problem can really only be fixed by one of three ways. Turn them up, down, or off. So, try and spend some time before the show getting as good and reliable a sound and mix as you can. And we'll give the last words on this subject to Randy. Fix a problem on stage mechanically first. That's much better than using electronics to fix a problem. So as an example, you have a feedback problem. If you can move a monitor, if you can move a speaker, if you can move a microphone, if you can move something physically to get rid of that feedback problem, it's much more effective than trying to do it with equalization. Our basic gig is playing music for restaurants and lounges. Sometimes uh, it's background music, sometimes it's more of a showcase. The instrumentation is uh, upright bass, acoustic guitar, and two vocal mics. Both the upright bass and the acoustic guitar have uh, preamp systems that boost the signal and give some basic EQ before it even gets into the board. Um, because we're not using guitar amps or bass amps, this, uh, this does really make a big difference as far as getting the right sound out of a PA. For our situation, it's worth using the larger 15-inch speaker because it really gets the full response of the acoustic instruments and vocals that we use. Speaker location can be a trick, depending upon the room. What we try and do is, is definitely use two speakers because that does help with the spread. Also using stands to get it off the floor is crucial, absolutely crucial. You also need to be careful of mic placement as relative to speakers as to not produce feedback. Uh, if you can't hear yourself from mains, then you may need to add some monitor speakers as well. As far as running your own sound, it can provide some unique challenges, including you know, setting the volumes out in the, out in the audience when you're on stage. Some ideas that we'll use are to use a CD player to get an overall volume setting, as well as to have, have my partner go out and listen to the various instruments played one at a time and make sure everything is, is going to come through just fine. Once we get the relative volumes set, we're able to use the master volume in order to change the volume as the performance would go on. It's very difficult to set sound in an empty room because as soon as you get some people in there, it drastically changes. Now you add people eating and 
drinking, the sky's the limit as far as what may happen. So having headroom on the top certainly makes a big difference as the night and energy level adjusts. One of the other issues of doing your own sound is having accessibility to the board. It's really important to be able to adjust settings on the fly and the color coding of the knobs and the intuitive design really makes that easy. Most times we'll use the mains as our own monitors simply because we're placed close enough to them we can hear just fine. However, if the room or certainly playing outside necessitates a larger speaker spread, we'll bring in monitors and have separate volumes for that. Since the two of us play together regularly, we know our relative volumes and have those preset within the PA. The only real adjustment then at gig time is generally the master volume and the occasional EQ adjustment. Because we're often setting up when people are already in the venue, ease of use and ease of load in is certainly important. Not having to run a bunch of spaghetti certainly makes the job quicker and easier. Here the PA is handling everything, guitar, bass, and vocal tracks. Uh, I've often played a wedding gig where we'll use this same PA head in three different locations, from a ceremony where we're piping in music, to dinner where we're playing in the, the setting you see here, to full band where we do dancing as the night goes on, using the same head in different uh, settings. Flexibility and portability and ease of use are, are key issues. In our situation, we have a what's called the blended worship style, where we have traditional and contemporary both. So we'll have a, a band with drums and bass and guitars and keyboards on the one hand, and then we'll go and we'll have a hymn on the, the electronic organ. And you go back and forth between, between those two, and you're sharing the spotlight with the spoken word. There's going to be a sermon, there's going to be liturgy, there's going to be other things. And you're also sharing it visually um, that way. So you've got, um, in many ways, the spoken word is going to be primary and the music secondary. So you, there's The room really changes mm -hmm. when it fills up with people in their Sunday best. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, they soak up a lot of sound. It's very advantageous to have as much of the wiring built in when, when I got here, there was already a 24-channel snake built into the building, but that had been added, you know, maybe about eight years ago with floor boxes where things are accessible so you don't have a lot of cabling on the floor. In terms of our mixing position, there was an old chapel up there, and they decided that, oh, that would be a great place to put the mixing board, so they chopped a hole in the wall and... Uh, put the mixing board up there. The problem is that you're essentially in another room and in order to really hear what the mix sounds like, you have to either stick your head out into that room or come down a flight of stairs and walk into the, you know, little bit to the back of the room, which I encourage our sound people to do. You know. We have a group of volunteers that uh, will do it. So you're dealing with, you know, different people at different times and Sometimes they're early and sometimes they're not. And sometimes, you know, if you deal with volunteers, you also have to do training, keeping them abreast of uh, what's going on so that, you know, that they, they're going to react to situations, that you're going to get a good mix, and they're not just going to sit there and say, oh, because I'm sitting at the soundboard, I'm the sound man. You know, you actually have to give them permission to make adjustments and, and listen and fix things, because otherwise they'll just say, oh, I think it's okay. Yeah, what we have is our 24 channel board and we've got it set up where we've got uh, singers and instrumentalists and then our primary speaker mics, the, we put the pastor on one channel and then the pass around hand mic on another channel. We also have a, a digital EQ that we have because we wanted to kind of contour the, the room to that. Um, one of the challenges that we deal with is that we're about 20 feet away from a four-lane highway 
and there's a tremendous amount of background noise, and so we had to really boost our signal to overcome that. But, you know, that's a, another challenge here. You know, it's an old building. Um, it, it leaks noise considerably. You know. It's been a, a good addition to have the, the handheld mic. But the, one of the challenges of that is that you're dealing in a short span of time with a lot of different volumes of people and different mic techniques. So you really have to ride the game to make sure that a very soft-spoken person will still be heard or you'll get some booming voice that all of a sudden, whoa, will overwhelm everyone. And so, you know, you have to be attentive as a sound person. You can't go to sleep in that kind of a situation. But for the music sections, you know, we try to set it uh, during the sound check and only make minor modifications. We have the, the pastor on a, a wireless lapel mic and then we have one other handheld mic. The technology is never foolproof. It's, but in a church setting, the key is to not have it be distracting, have it be enabling, have it um, support the message and not take away from it. I mean, it is necessary so that everyone can hear, so that things can be balanced, so that acoustic and electric instruments can all come through and shine. But if, it's, if there's a hum, if there's feedback, if there's no signal, all of a sudden, Everybody's worried about that, and they've lost their ability to concentrate on the message, on what's going on. And so if people notice the sound system as little as possible, and they just hear what's going on in church, then you've achieved your goal. Whether you grew up singing in church, or playing in local clubs or restaurants, it's natural to harbour some dreams of ending up here, on a large concert stage with thousands of adoring fans. There are many ways to make the transition, but few more unusual than the way Alan Parsons did it. Alan went from studio engineer in the 1960s to multi-platinum recording artist in the 70s and 80s. But, strangely enough, he never performed live. Then in the 1990s, Alan started taking his live project on the road, from clubs to theatres, stadiums, which he continues to do all over the world to this day. Speaking to Alan just before Soundcheck at the Cerritos Performing Arts Center in California, we asked how different it is playing large venues. There's no specific differences between a, a, a small uh, club environment to a huge stadium, really. It's still the same job. Um, you've obviously got uh, acoustic differences to deal with. Um, and, and obviously, um, you know, a stadium type of uh, environment needs a lot more oomph in the, uh, you know, literally the number of speakers and the placement of them. The job, believe it or not, uh, f mixing for front of house is actually a little bit like mixing a record. I mean, it's, you, it's, you're just taking a number of tracks, which uh, equates to a number of microphones. And um, just getting the best possible balance, obviously, with different acoustics, you're going to uh, be working with a, a different series of balances according to how the acoustic is going to deal with it. You might find that in one venue you'll be working your vocals a lot louder than in another uh, environment. In a, in a concert hall, um, because there are natural acoustics at work, you're probably going to be working your reverbs to a lesser extent than you might. Having said that, you can get enormous benefit from using limiters wisely, particularly on vocals. Uh, so that you don't get the obvious high, low, dynamic things. You, you can't hear the quiet lines and you, the loud lines are blasting your head off. Um, but uh, that's always at, at the expense of the possibility of feedback. The levels of the amplified instrument is, is crucial. If you've got too much, uh, too much level from the guitar amp, for instance, coming from the stage, that's going to be a problem to you. You're going to find that you're working with your fader all the way down back here and just the sound of his amp is, uh, is feeding only the front rows and the people at the back can't hear it. So, I mean, you, you have to, uh, that's an important consideration to get a good balance coming from the stage so that the guy back here can uh, realistically um, balance what, what there is. EQ is very much uh, a taste thing. Um, it's also a fashion thing. I mean, uh, one thing that's happened to live sound in the last few years is that uh, subwoofers have come into their own and uh, people are expecting a big thumping a larger than life kick drum sound which personally I don't like particularly and I, I uh, 
kind of uh, steer the crews behind our show against that uh, general philosophy. You know, just because you can get an, a larger than life bass sound doesn't mean, doesn't mean to say you have to. Alan not only began his career working in studios, engineering sessions for people like the Beatles and Pink Floyd, he also produced and mixed a string of hit albums. We asked what challenges or tricks there are to bringing high quality studio performances to life on stage. It's a slightly unusual situation for a, a guy who has done this job to be <laughs> actually on stage playing. You know, so the, the sound that the public hears is only going to be as good as the sound coming from the stage. So I mean, if you've got a good band with their own good sounds um, and good microphones, your job is obviously made that much easier. Experience is everything. Um, I mean, uh, knowing the material, uh, very important. Garbage out out of the stage will mean garbage out to the audience. And that, that's just the way it is. So if it's sounding good on stage, you can be pretty sure that uh, if you've got a good uh, front of house guy at the helm, it's going to sound pretty good. It's, it's all down to uh, working as a team, make, making sure that uh, everybody knows what job they have to do, who's going to play a solo when, um, who's got the lead vocal, who's got an important harmony part, who's, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's all the same thing as, um, as a studio recording would be, except it's, you only get one chance at it. <laughs> That's the big difference. you can do to make sure all these electronics is going to work is make sure that your AC source is reliable and dependable. These five dollar uh, little AC checkers here that will give you an idea as to whether or not your services work is a wonderful investment for making sure your AC supply is reliable. We buy them uh, and all of our technicians generally go out with, uh, with this or a voltmeter if they're doing something more complicated. But even if you're just plugging it on the wall just to make sure it works before you start questioning all the other equipment in your rack, plug one of these in just to make sure that you're coming up with the two yellow lights and something's not a problem which will then make all the rest of this not matter because the gear won't work. Not only is it vital to make sure your equipment is in good repair, try to use equipment that has passed good safety standards testing when it was first made. Every piece of Yamaha equipment has passed rigorous testing for safety using the UL, CUL or CE standard. We find that cables are some of the most important parts of our system to have, so we get the raw materials and build them ourselves as a way to make sure that the stuff that we're putting on our shows is reliable and dependable. It's worth the effort to us because the, the biggest show that we have at any one given time can be brought down by the smallest piece of cable, and for us, our, our clients are expecting that we'll have all these pieces working and reliable. This is a way for us to make sure that they are. Sound levels are relative. A gunshot heard a mile away will seem much quieter than a person talking right into your ear. Sound levels will also vary depending upon location. A tiny PA set up in a bathroom will be deafening. Set the same system up in a park and it'll hardly be heard. Why? Because sound will be reflected and bounced about in your bathroom, but in a park it won't meet with any resistance at all. It'll just float away. Both of these principles become crucial when you're setting up sound reinforcement systems for outdoors. Almost certainly, you will need to add power, both in terms of amplifiers and loudspeakers. You begin the show thinking about loadout. When we load in, when we start our setup, we're thinking about how we're going to take it out. Because we have to do this every day, right? So this is well and good for this show here, but we have to do this time in Atlanta tomorrow, in New Jersey the next day, in New York the next day. It's got to be fast, orchestrated, uh, quick, easy, methodical, and every part of it has to be, you know, like an orchestra, like a, like a scripted thing. You think of the show as a thing that you're watching, but it's not. The show is a thing that's constantly in, in flux, and it's moving, and it's 
growing and it's shrinking and, and it's always evolving in ways that everybody else doesn't see. But people that are working it every day see all those iterations of it and all those, you know, little pieces that happen to make it become this whole thing. You know, you're trying to catch on to it and try to, you know, evolve it into what it's supposed to be and you're trying to steer it, but it, it kind of is its own thing also. You know, I mean, it's kind of, no matter what you do, it is its own entity, you know, so you have to try to deal with that, so. Even on the lowliest sound reinforcement system, there's always a ton of cables, and somewhere along the line, this is what one or more of them is going to produce. Yup, noise. Be it a hum, a hiss, or a crackle, noise and sound reinforcement are always potential partners on stage. Noise can be drastically reduced by maintaining good gain structure throughout the signal path. Here are several other good practices and things to avoid. Avoid having signal cable lying alongside AC power cables. Turn off open channels on your mixer or unnecessary auxiliary routings. Don't skimp on cabling. Use balanced cable whenever possible and put those antique cables with a cracked insulation and permanent kinks in the museum where they belong. Intermittent crackles are almost certainly bad cables or bad connectors. Be systematic. Isolate the culprit, then replace or fix the lead. A low frequency hum is most often caused by a ground loop. Don't automatically disconnect the earth on equipment. Be systematic. Try and isolate the source of the problem, move equipment around, and then use ground lifts. Another common source of AC noise or hum is lighting. Dimmers often add a good bit of noise back into the AC line. If your system is portable, you should be prepared to move to a different outlet by carrying a heavy-duty extension cord. This will usually clear up the problem. Distortion through a sound reinforcement system is one of the most unpleasant sounds around. Do everything you can to avoid putting your audience or yourself through this torture. Distortion can be caused by many things. First, isolate the problem. Is it being caused by one channel? Lower all of the faders and then raise each of them in turn. Or is it a global problem? If sound from one channel is distorted, check your input gain and adjust it by reducing the gain or applying a pad. If it's a mic channel, try using another channel. If the mic has batteries, make sure they're good and fresh. If it's still distorted, try another mic cable, then another mic. Check you're not overloading the mixer with excessive EQ. If you have a device connected to the channel's insert I.O., disconnect it. Check if too much signal is going into or coming back from an AUX bus. Finally, if you can't cure it, plug the mic or instrument into another channel. If distortion seems to be a global problem, systematically go through the signal path to make sure the gain structure is good, i.e. operate the mixer at higher output levels while attenuating the signal at the power amplifier. Make sure the amp is not clipping or overloading. Check all of your cables and connections. Check your speakers. Perhaps your system is maxed out and it's time to add a subwoofer to take some of the load off the main speakers. Possibly you may have blown a speaker. A great thing about the sound system is that you can easily troubleshoot and correct these problems as you can unplug and repatch inputs and other connections until you find the problem. Just remember to follow the signal logically through the system and then you'll easily be able to isolate the culprit. Staying focused and being systematic with your approach will soon fix the problem. Feedback is not always undesirable. Where would any self-respecting lead guitarist be without it? But seriously, in a sound reinforcement system, feedback caused by a mic or pickup on an acoustic guitar, ow. This sound even outpaces distortion in terms of being tortured to listen to. So, what is it? How do you get rid of it? And how can you avoid it happening again? Put simply, feedback is the harsh, piercing, ringing sound that occurs when a loop is created through the microphone or pickup picking up its own sound coming out of loudspeakers, and so feeding back into the system in a never-ending cycle. The first thing to avoid, then, is pointing a live mic directly at your loudspeakers, 
In fact, avoid placing mics anywhere in front of your main speakers at all if you can. Feedback stapled out is volume. Turn the sound down and you'll cut off its food supply. While effective and certainly essential if you're in the middle of a performance, this is only a temporary fix. So let's look at ways that you can reduce the likelihood of it happening in the first place. Feedback often starts as a gentle ring around a certain pitch before intensifying and turning into a full-blown whistle. You can help reduce it by identifying the pitch of the ring and then reduce that particular frequency using a graphic or parametric EQ. This is also called notching it out. This will buy you a bit more level, but you can be sure that the ring will reoccur at another frequency and when you correct it, another and so on as you try to increase the output. Your sound system has now reached what's called maximum acoustic gain, which simply means that the whole system, performers, electronics and the room as they are set up currently cannot get any louder. Measures you will want to look at are the positioning of the mics and the speakers, especially monitor speakers on stage. Experiment with different mics that use different polar patterns and try and make sure that performers are close to their mics. Don't forget, they are part of the sound system too. There are also so-named feedback eliminators on the market that you might want to investigate if feedback is a persistent problem and your budget can accommodate some additional expense. But even these devices can only help somewhat and they do add some artefacts or colour the sound. Silence is very far from golden if you're in the middle of a show. If your sound reinforcement system fails completely, it's most likely a major power issue, such as an overloaded and or blown fuse in your amplifiers. Other major components can fail, of course, such as your mixer or the main cables. If your main amp fails and you have a decent monitor system, you may need to face the monitors out towards your audience and at least keep the show limping along. But let's hope that by watching this DVD, Silence you will have all but avoided most practices that could deal you this most unwelcome hand. There are times when you might need to shut the system down yourself. Aside from real calamities like fire or earthquakes, rain at an outdoor show is probably your most likely enemy. Electricity and water are not good companions, nor are moisture and drivers in a loudspeaker enclosure. If drivers ever do get wet, they need to be thoroughly dried out and checked out before being used again. Here is a short list of good habits to get into, not only to keep your sound as good as it can be, but also to keep your sanity. Use balanced cable whenever possible. Coil cables properly. Don't add stress or kinks. Label and store items for easy identification. Keep your stage free of clutter. Use cable ties. Use cable the right length not way longer than you need. Use protective cases and covers. Keep plenty of spares, fuses, cables, amps. Trash bags can be great to cover gear in an emergency if you're outside. Turn your amps on last and off first to avoid damaging your loudspeakers. Finally, here is a list of support equipment you should always keep handy if you're running a sound reinforcement system. A CD player for testing your system. A Maglite flashlight. A Sharpie. Connectors, adapters, signal ground lifters. Fuses for everything that has a fuse. And your guitar player's amplifier too. A soldering iron and solder. Three kinds of tape. Gaffer, or at least duct tape electrical, board tape, a basic toolkit, headphones, batteries for all the gear that uses them. So how does it feel to be a fully trained sound engineer then? Oh, don't worry, live sound is a bit like gardening. It's a constant learning and growing process. No one, even the top professionals, really knows everything. We hope that this program has given you some basic skills that you can now go out and apply in real life. But even these skills can twist and turn as new technologies come onto the market. So please check in at Yamaha.com where you can get the latest news on subjects discussed in this DVD along with links to related websites. Thanks for watching and good luck.